I'm going to talk to you today about Everything to Everybody, which is a big project I'm leading in Birmingham, which has two sort of twin objectives. They're, they're on the screen. Uh, one of which is unlocking what is the world's first great Shakespeare library for all. Um, that is in Birmingham. It's part of Birmingham City Library's collection. Um, and then more broadly using Birmingham's forgotten past to inspire our future. Um, but there, there is a big project that I can talk about which will hope to, to deliver on these grand aims. But this is a research seminar and I'm going to talk a bit more to you today about the pioneer of both the Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library and of something much bigger, really, the, 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 uh, of the idea um, and realisation of what does have a real claim to be the world's first modern city. And that person is called George Dawson. Um, and Birmingham has, you may be surprised to hear, as, as I was surprised to find out, has a real claim to being a, a Shakespearean city. That is George Dawson. You'll see a better picture of him later. You know who that is. That's Shakespeare. So Dawson stood under a medallion of Shakespeare's face in the right in the civic heart of Birmingham in what is now Chamberlain Square. It was then Ratcliffe Square or Place. Um, from 1881, his, this monument was erected at the same time as the Chamberlain Monument. Many of you will know that monument. It's not a very personal monument, actually. There is a medallion of Cham Chamberlain's face on it, but you have to look quite hard to see it. This is a very personal monument. as a life-sized man um, speaking in a fairly relaxed attitude by Victorian standards to passers-by. So I say right in the heart of Birmingham, and it stood there till 1951. So pretty much within living memory, not for many people here, but nevertheless, it, it's, it's it, till fairly recent date, it stood there proclaiming um, something about Birmingham and about the kind of civilization it sought to embody. Um, as many of you, probably all of you know, in Shakespeare's lifetime, Birmingham was about the same size as Stratford. So it's a city of very recent vintage. In fact, it wasn't a city in George Dawson's time. It's, it's later on in the 19th century that it gets city status. It mushrooms with the Industrial Revolution into a, into a town, soon to be a city, which sees itself as the second city of empire. Um, and as I say, you've got right at the heart of you, you've got this strange forgotten man, George Dawson, somehow inspired by Shakespeare and others, as I will say. Um, so who was George Dawson? One contemporary pictures him as follows. How clearly, how vividly he stands out in memory. The mass of iron gray hair, heavily streaked with white, nearly covering his ears, quite covering his low, broad forehead, bushy eyebrows, nearly straight, and beneath them dark brown eyes that twinkled and flashed and blazed and melted, the nose straight or nearly so, the mouth partly hidden by a straggling beard, firm but not so firm that it could not scorn or quiver with emotion. The face was lined and seamed, the face of a man who'd known many sorrows, who'd carried his own burden of care and the burdens of others also. His voice when he spoke to you was full and deep and rather husky. The voice of a man who'd struggled and suffered, who'd known disappointed and disappointment and defeat in the service of great causes and in the pursuit of noble ideas. There was a note of scorn in it at times, a note of pity in it always. The man himself was of middle height, broad and sturdy, slow in the movements of the body, swift in the movements of the head. And lastly, one of the little things, almost always a velvet coat, or at least a velvet waistcoat, with a necktie that was any colour but white. In short, a man thoroughly unclerical, unprofessional, unusual, altogether unlike ordinary men. If you saw him in a crowd, you'd have marked him out. If you heard him speak, you'd have watched him and waited for him to speak again. Such was George Dawson in the later years of his life. But he was a young man when he came to Birmingham, and he came in the fire and freshness of his youth. 
Dawson was controversial. He never altogether lost that fire and freshness. But not long after he came to Birmingham in the late 1840s, he was perhaps the most hated man in England. Minister of a church which he himself called the Church of the Doubters, friend to exiled European insurrectionists like the Hungarian Kossuth and the Italian Mazzini, friend also to the memory of Oliver Cromwell, Dawson comprehensively and courageously reinvented religion and canonical culture for new times as a vocation for radically insurgent activism and solidarity, both at home and abroad. He championed workers' rights, recreation and education. He brought the latest art and ideas to Birmingham and he really, he spoke to Birmingham audiences in front of pre-Raphaelite paintings almost as, as they were drying on the canvas. Um, um, lost my place now, I got so excited. Um, <laughs> he, he even brought Kossuth to the city and hundreds of thousands turned, literally turned out to see the Magyar Revolution in a city centre that was festooned with the Hungarian tricolor, which is quite an amazing thing to think of in the context of Brexit. He was notorious in Australia, a scion of the Blythe family who'd come over from Adelaide in around 1860, I'm quoting, expressed his surprise that there was not more anti-Dawson talk. He said such feeling was much stronger with them in Adelaide in the mid 19th century, and Dawson's still a young man. Still, by the time of his death, Dawson had won over Birmingham and seemingly the world. At the unveiling of the first statue, what I showed you was the second statue. I mean, Dawson's a d distinction of Dawson is that they loved him so much they rejected the first statue, the people of the city, as, as insufficiently like him. And so a second one had to be erected. Um, but when the first statue was unveiled, it was announced solemnly that the gathering that day was not merely a town's gathering, not merely a Birmingham meeting. The name of George Dawson was famous. His friends abounded far down in the south, beneath the bright beams of the Southern Cross and far away amid the golden homes of the setting sun on the Pacific coast. I want to think a little bit more, talk a little bit more about the statue. It's the work of one F.J. Williamson, or the, although the canopy is the work of J.H. Chamberlain, not a relation of Joseph Chamberlain, but the great architect of, of, of Birmingham, really. He built the board schools, um, he built Chamberlain's Highbury, he built, he designed the Shakespeare Memorial Room, which I'll go on to talk about. Um, so I've, I've said there's a picture of, sorry, a medallion of Shakespeare on one face, but of course it has four faces. And the other faces, um, literally faces, are those of Bunyan um, and of um, Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, Dawson's contemporary. He knew, Dawson knew Carlyle and accompanied Carlyle on his first trip to Germany and Oliver Cromwell. And let's remember, this is right in the heart of Birmingham, in the civic square of Birmingham. You've got the most personal monument to a man who is inspired by Shakespeare, Bunyan, nonconformist religion, Carlyle, um, a scion, a Scottish scion of something similar, but brought up and updated for, for a more secular age, and the man who faced up to the challenges, intellectual challenges of the modern day, um, perhaps most. Um, squarely, and then Oliver Cromwell. Um, so it tilts Shakespeare's influence very much in an anti-establishment direction. Um, Bunyan representing reformed religion, Cromwell leading to revolution, Carlyle wrote about Cromwell was partly inspired by him, and then, and then Shakespeare somehow embodying, as if the plays embody a richly specific model for that renovated new life that Dawson was interested in. Um, but I, I think this monument also stands for something else, which is the unity of culture, really. It runs together politics, religion, um, art, um, and civic life. Um, and Dawson absolutely spoke for that. Life, he said, should be a manifestation of one's spirit and should, that should be the result of the highest style of thinking. I mean, again, a really intellectually ambitious position to take, but one that he sees as utterly continuous with local government. Um, he spoke vociferously against departments and sequestered specialism, despising any division of experience into religious life, political life, academic life, etc. 
Shakespeare, Carlyle, Bunyan, Cromwell, letters, poetry, religion, politics, all but faces and facets for Dawson of the one life in which they inhere and which we individ as individuals live together. Dawson would fundamentally have opposed the climate of splintering specialism in our modern universities. And it became his conviction, faith even, that everything connects in life and can only be justified by that standard, which is what afforded art and literature its inalienable vocation for politics. And since there's so much life in Shakespeare, Dawson thought, Shakespeare is an important agency for enlarging Birmingham and wider culture. Now this, all had to be proclaimed directly to the people because he, there are no barriers for Dawson um, between tribes or creeds or, and in fact, last week, I, it, it occurred to me that it's sort of amazing that Dawson and John Henry Newman, who wrote the idea of the university and was recently canonized by the Catholic Church, are in Birmingham at the same time. Um, I'd seen no, 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 no acknowledgement really of this. And I found a letter from, from, um, from Newman about a portrait that had been commissioned of him and praising and expressing his gratitude to Dawson and Timmins, the other founder of the Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library, for coming to see it, for coming to see it and play, pay their respects, which is sort of amazing because Dawson was such a nonconformist and a sort of revolutionary. And, but it suggests a time where those sorts of divisions could also be reached across. Um, so Dawson wanted to speak across divisions and I think you see that in the what could be seen as a rather undistinguished statue in a way but the fact that he's there talking in a casual attitude very typical of him he used to lean on Alexa a bit like I'm doing which might be perfectly conventional now wasn't conventional in the Victorian period at all um, and there they the sculptor Thomas Woolner the pre-Raphaelite has pictured him sorry yeah embodied him just speaking to people as they walk past and that's absolutely right for Dawson because that's what he did he believed that everything was shareable quite literally with with everybody he said the highest truths that's his phrase of course not mine everything to everybody he said the highest truths are cognizable by all he believed in a kind of Pauline way that you could proclaim all things to all men and women you just had to get your address right um, and he himself did do that. He spoke to enormous audiences and made a lot of money on the most abstruse top topics, I and mean, it's amazing. So he spoke about Goethe's Faust, um, Marlowe's Faustus, which I think is quite early to be talking about Marlowe's Faustus. I'm looking at my distinguished colleagues who know more about such things than me. And, and Bailey's Festus in the, in the Mechanics Institute in Manchester and made an enormous amount of money. Um, made 900 pounds on a lecture tour in America on such abstruse, a lot of money in the 19th century. He, was, he, he, he spoke at the Birmingham Midlands Institute, which may be known to some of you, but was, and should be known better to all of us. It was founded in 1854 for the advancement of um, higher learning throughout all classes. He called for a people's college he spoke at the people's hall he was opposed to what we call dumbing down not afflicted with what in birmingham charles dickens called the cox comical idea of writing down to the popular intelligence his speaking statue memorialized his absolute conviction that anything can be said to anyone um oh, this is a that's uh, the Albert Memorial, as you know, and I, I wanted to bring that up because, of course, it's fairly, you can see the relationship, can't you? But, but Albert's sitting on his throne, a bit like a god. Uh, it's a rather wonderful memorial, and Albert has, um, there's a, a lot to be said for it, Prince Albert. But again, and any of you who've looked at it, I mean, there's a kind of infinite panoply of culture around him. It's all of culture, whereas the Dawson Monument seems to say this is a specific vision of what culture is, a bit more militant an insurgent. Um, so there it is again, as you say, you see, you can see people walking past it. And that was the sketch. And Thomas Woolner also wanted to memorialize Dawson as a man speaking to the city, not a monarch, not a mortal god like Albert in his shrine, not a priest or a professor set apart. I have never been presented with an honorary degree, Dawson said, and I have never been made a knight. 
Honours in the common sense I have not coveted, and the world has done me the credit of thinking I did not want them. I mean, an unforgettable phrase, I think. He made no pretensions to the title reverend. He was a preacher, but of a church which had no official doctrine or dogma. So whether it was a church or not is a, an, another question. Um, there were some things he thought could be said to men and women useful to be said. They thought he was able to say them. That was all. He was no priest, no dignitary of the church. He was not reverend, but reverent. Um, and he said that actually, incidentally, at a dramatic supper for John Toole, who was the comic actor in the first, first actor who had a, a theatre named after him in London and in the West End. And Dawson said, you know, even reverence actors, you know, I'm here as a nonconformist minister, but I represent, I reverence, and in nonconformist Birmingham, that was quite a thing to, to say. Um, finally, I think what that statue represents is the collaborative improvisation of a culture. So you've got Dawson standing under these great living luminaries. Of course, they're actually dead, but they, they're part of his message. Um, and he's speaking it directly to all of the people of the city in the common square. Um, in Emma, which was first published in 1816, Jane Austen put the following words into the mouth of Mrs. Elton. They came from Birmingham which is not a place to promise much, you know, Mr. Weston. <laughs> One has not great hopes from Birmingham. I always say there's something direful in the very sound. <laughs> but inside 50 years, Dawson was able to speak of Birmingham as, quote, the chief centre of civilization, the chief town of democracy, the town from which liberty radiates to all the world. The minister of Carl's Lane Chapel, the reforming evangelical theologian and himself something of a Shakespearean, R.W. Dale, whose life and ministry were inspired by Dawson, said in a more streetwise idiom, Birmingham was no mean city. During the 1870s and the early 1880s, it acquired the international reputation of being, quote, the best governed city in the world. Quote, municipal reformers looked to Birmingham as the eyes of the faithful are turned to Mecca, quote. It was, quote, a powerhouse of moral and material energies, quote. Nothing was impossible. Dale said, if we're true to each other and true to this town, we may do deeds as great as were done by Pisa, by Florence, by Venice in their triumphant days. Um, and they thought that Birmingham could be even more, as absurd as it may sound to you, but e even more beautiful than those great Italian cities because the beauty it would acquire would be a specifically moral beauty, the beauty of sharing everything with everybody and making a new and more equal and creative civilization. This newly invented, new minted city was, quote, an achievement of the creative imagination. It was also regard, regarded itself and was regarded widely as the first mon modern metropolis. E.P. Hennock says there was no successful precedent to which to turn. By the 1880s, we read in the words of the doyen of, 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 of Victorian civic culture, the Ace of Briggs, the characteristic features of the Birmingham doctrine had become widely accepted in England. And that doctrine would come to influence the world so far as you will recall as Australia. And the profit of this new movement was, it was largely agreed, though he's forgotten today, was George Dawson. George, Joseph Chamberlain, Birmingham's greatest reforming mayor, he was in office from 1873 to 1876, and he's since eclipsed Dawson in the historical record and in Birmingham's mem memory, himself admitted, it's a great thing to say of a man that he's influenced the life of a great town, and it's true, and we know it, that if this great town has its special characteristics, they are the, due to the teachings of George Dawson. Carlyle called him Brummigan Dawson, and there was indeed a sense in which Dawson was Birmingham. If he's remembered at all today, it was his for his so-called civic gospel. It's not a phrase he used, but it's a useful phrase. And I think what it's meant to suggest is Dawson is somebody who transfused the passion and mission of religion into civic politics. Um, in a speech typically taken as the touchstone of the civic gospel, he said at the opening of Birmingham's Corporation Library that this new library announced to the world, quote, a conviction that a town like this exists for moral and intellectual purposes. So it's not just a, a, an agglomeration of people looking for work. 
And a library like this, like the one Dawson was o opening, is a proclamation that a great community like this, I'm quoting him, is not to be looked upon as a fortuitous concourse of human atoms or as a miserable knot of vipers struggling in a pot, each aiming to get his head above the other in the fierce struggle of competition. Not by bread alone was his scriptural rubric. A city, I'm quoting, must have its parks as well as its prisons, its art gallery as well as its asylum its books and its libraries, as well as its baths and wash houses, its schools, as well as its sewers. It must think of beauty and of dignity, no less than of order and of health. Um, Dawson, you know, who sat on every committee in Birmingham, as well as producing these extraordinary lectures, and was involved in securing an extraordinary range of actual political reforms also wanted a beauty society for, for Birmingham, and he wanted Birmingham men to say, I'm quoting, with the passion of the Jews of old, I will go round Jerusalem and tell the towers thereof. I will stand on the bullocks and look at the beauty of the city. Um, and it was this sort of, that I could go on, it was this sort of attitude that, that, that helped to make Birmingham, according to Alfred St. Johnson in 1877, sorry, 1887, perhaps the most artistic town in England. I mean, not what we perhaps think of Birmingham as today. Um, literally central to the life of this most artistic city was Birmingham's revolutionary Shakespeare library. And in fact, Dawson stood under that medallion of, of Shakespeare in the same square. So the Shakespeare library is more or less behind, behind him. So you could, you could look at that, but it wasn't gestural, and then you could go into the Shakespeare Library, which you yourself owned as a, as, as, as a citizen of this, this city. When 1864 and the tercentenary of Shakespeare's birth was, uh, were approaching, Dawson and Birmingham decided they didn't want a statue. Dawson actually growled, let, let Stratford endow its own boys. Um, in, 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 instead, he, they, they decided that if the gentle poet could himself appear amongst them, I'm quoting again, of course, then he would wish for no nobler monument than that of being enshrined in the memories and hearts of hard-working men in this town. And the feeling that the conceptions of his mind and his noble expressions were clearing and illuminating the path of the hard-working artisan, that the leaves of his divine works were being turned over by the hardy hands of our own forge men, would be greater pleasure to him than any sculptured marble or star-pointing pyramid. It's difficult to overestimate, I think, the importance of the now forgotten Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library they founded instead. To so Birmingham belongs the credit of having reared the noblest monument to the memory of England's greatest poet, as one local historian put it. The largest and most varied collection of Shakespeare's works in the English and foreign literature illustrating them, which has ever yet been made, and the greatest literary memorial which any author has ever yet received. Confirmation of the centrality of the Shakespeare Library to the civic gospel comes in the form of architect and subscriber, J.H., not Joseph, Chamberlain's arresting of, of, of Owl, that he should like the Shakespeare idea, the Shakespeare idea, to grow in the same proportion as the accumulation of their Shakespeare property. So it wasn't meant just to be a kind of posh, or room which kind of ornamented the city and dressed it up as culture. It was meant to promulgate and further this the Shakespeare idea, whatever that was, we'll return to that. The collection very quickly outgrew the splendid Shakespeare Memorial Room, which housed the library. Um, according to a confirmed conviction on the part of Chamberlain and others, that the Shakespeare Library ought to be the very best room in town. Sorry, I messed up the syntax there. It did outgrow it. But, it, but this wonderful room is the fruit of and expresses the idea that, that its architect had that the Shakespeare Library ought to be the very best room in town, not accepting the council chamber of the new municipal building. And that tells you a lot as, as, as well. It, it, it's not just a, you know, a posh antechamber. That there's some relationship between civic government, the Shakespeare idea, and the actual government and life and culture of the city that they feel it expresses, that there was an attempt to make a Shakespearean city in Birmingham. And it 
So the Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library flung its door o doors open. It has to be said, I think, from the perspective of democratic inclusiveness, that the foundation of degree courses in English in Oxford in 1894, Cambridge in 1912, as well as the endowments of chairs a bit later, looks like a regrettable narrowing, one over which which over the past hundred or years or so has had the effect of withdrawing Shakespeare in English into the possession of an educated elite. In 1849, Dawson offered evidence before the Parliamentary Committee who were scoping out the possibilities for public libraries, saying that, quote, the higher class of poetry was very much read by working people, those of them who could read, I presume he means, but Shakespeare is known by heart, almost. And Dickens concurred, declaring, I believe there are in Birmingham at this moment many working men infinitely better versed in Shakespeare and Milton than your average of fine gentlemen. When the Central Lending Library was open, Dawson denounced the prejudice against working men reading literature as, quote, old patronising twaddle of the last generation. <laughs> that day was gone, he said. The building of this library would put an end to all such twaddle for the future. And if that announcement seems regrettably premature, consider these. The time of private ownership has nearly come to an end. The, 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 day would, the day would come when a man would be ashamed to shut up a picture by Raphael or any statue by a great master in a private house. The gifts of genius should be like sunshine, open to all, for all, to be reached by all, ultimately to be understood and enjoyed by all. That great democratic dawn has yet to arrive but Dawson and the founders of the Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library did all they could to bring it on. In an early lecture on the collection, Dawson's co-founder Samuel Timmins emphasised just as much as the world-class complement of early fo folios and quartos, a quote, series of keys which open all the rest to general readers, to any ordinary intelligent reader, lexicons, concordances. And the chief librarian, Mr Mullins, groundbreaking comprehensive catalogue, um, of all Shakespearean literature. The list of occupations of readers given in the annu general annual reports for the Birmingham Reference Library suggests all sort of people did indeed use it. The record for 1872 includes hairdressers, electroplaters, grocers, japaners and enamelers, gum makers, steel toy makers, and one pearl worker. It was natural that Birmingham should quickly become the birthplace of the National Education League. Dawson said at its first meeting on the 12th of October 1869, we wish to lay the foundation of a national education system. It must be laid with great simplicity and great breadth. So what was the Shakespeare idea that they, they, they wanted to co co convey? I mean, I think the movement for open education represented by the foundation of the library combined this commitment to, to breadth with an equally intense commitment to depth. It wasn't just that, as Lawson, Dawson said, the highest truths are cognizable by all. Even more importantly, the lesson of Shakespeare's supreme characterization is in Dawson's phrase that every man or woman is a great original fact. Such was the great pearl which the solitary pearl wor worker might have discovered in the reading room in 1872, and thereby being inducted into the progressive culture of a modern city for which it was the first all generating principle. So he, what Dawson want is, wants is depth for everybody, and he refuses to believe that that can't be given away. It can't be found that people's um, individual power can't be, in, they can't be endowed with that and therefore make a contribution to a pluralistic city. Civic gospel. One of his great attributes, I think, is the honesty and directness with which Dawson faces up to the challenges of contemporary culture not the least among which is the question of what to do with the passion and energy of religion in an increasingly rationalist and secular age. Dawson was a great preacher. One contemporary recalls running into Robert Martineau, mayor of Birmingham in 1846, after hearing Dawson preach for the first time. I can hear him now exclaiming, oh, Will, this is the preaching I have longed for all my life. Literature was the road down which Dawson brought religion into the world. And his unconventional hymn book, he made his own, includes texts by Schiller in translation, Wordsworth and Carlyle, as well as bits from all over the spectrum of, uh, the confessional spectrum, bits of, 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 of all kinds of different liturgies and 
political songs. Dawson wanted Shakespeare open on a lectern in all places of worship, and he predicted that, quote, empty churches would then begin to fill, strong benches would groan beneath the weight of attentive hearers, sleepers would be unfrequent, and the clergyman would cease to be looked upon as an anodyne. Bardolatry has long been a term of intellectual abuse in Shakespeare studies. Ben Jonson professed, of course, to admire Shakespeare this side, idolatry. But such careful piety seems quaintly outmoded in our own more secular age. George Bernard Shaw coined the term bardolatry to gas castigate that shameless evasion of the political problems of contemporary life, which often dresses itself up as a love of Shakespeare. But as I hope we'll see for Dawson, Shakespeare offered a way of finding the world which conventional religion too often evaded. Shakespeare also offered a future he felt for religion in the modern industrial world, without which Dawson was convinced we could not live. He quotes Carlyle himself quoting uh, uh, the German thinker Novalis. If men have lost belief in a god, their only resource against a blind no-god of necessity and mechanism that held them like a hideous world steam engine, they'd be with or without ho hope revolt. They could, as Novalis says, by a simultaneous universal act of suicide, depart out of the world steam engine and end, if not in victory, yet in invincibility, an unsubduable protest that such world steam engine was a failure and a stupidity. Now that is talking straight. But how are we to avoid such mass despairing suicide? In an age like this, when the foundation of old faiths was shaken, when the works of their fathers tottered and crumbled and fell, when in politics the fight became bitter, when in theology the ground which should be covered by religion and binding man and man together became too often the only the field of conflict. In these days, when in their social life many terrible problems pressed for solution, when even in their own immediately and friendly circles great difficulty sometimes occurred, Shakespeare, according to Dawson and his Birmingham friends, was the way forward. As Emerson suggested, he wrote the text for modern life. We know that for humanity there is now a worldwide religion, Dawson announced. The religion not of the Greek or Jew, the rich or the poor, the sage or the sage, but the religion for humankind, the religion of human nature. And Shakespeare for Dawson made this more than merely gestural sentimentality, showed what form this might take. For, quote, there was something higher and nobler in William Shakespeare than his dramatic merits. In Birmingham, quote, they claimed for him a higher morality than perhaps had ever been claimed before. A satirical poster from the archive of the Library of Birmingham indicates how far Dawson was willing to go in this di direction. So that's, presumably this was pasted up to mock Dawson in Birmingham, but George Dawson on the Bible and on Shakespeare and the crucial bit here is on the Bible, therefore they did not believe anything just because it was written in the scriptures. And on Shakespeare, the final thing is the first general canon for the interpretation of Shakespeare was that he was always right. <laughs> so the maker of this poster is scorning a, the, the, the kind of disjunction between a Shakespearean fundamentalism and free thinking in relation to the Bible. But I think Dawson would have been quite happy with that, really. He sees a sort of liberal fundamentalism in Shakespeare, a sort of fundamental pluralism that he wishes to commit to. He prefer prefers that to dogmatic biblical fundamentalism. Dawson in his church preached on Shakespeare, preached on Muhammad, preached on ev evolution. It's an extraordinary thing. For, for Emerson, um, Shakespeare was insufficiently religious. The world still wants its poet priest, that's Emerson. This was because, as Dawson phrased it, there's nothing about the priest about Shakespeare. No conscious attempt to lift man from where he is to where he ought to be. But for Dawson, precisely that, Shakespeare's realism, is what makes him religiously serviceable for new times. I look upon him, Dawson says, as planned with one great intention, that in him should be wrought out what, in deference to my clerical friends, I will call the lay duty of mankind. So he, Dawson thinks that Shakespeare reveals a new way for religion, a new responsibility to life as it actually is lived. He might have been taking a bearing from Carlyle here, who saw Shakespeare as, quote, a man justly related to all things and men, a good man, a prophet in his way, of an insight analogous to the prophetic, though he took it up in another strain. 
Carlyle even saw Shakespeare as the priest of a true Catholicism, the universal church of the future and of all times. This universal church of Latter-day Saint Shakespeare becomes comprehensible, I think, if we see in it the broad church of modern liberalism, from which Carlyle ultimately recoiled, but to which Dawson always remained actively devoted. He, Dawson's interest in Shakespeare and morality dates back to the philosophical essays he penned as a young man between 18 and 20. In his last annual lecture to the Birmingham R. Shakespeare Club, of which he was life president, he presented reading Shakespeare as a course in tolerance. But he said that if you read Shakespeare, you learn that, that, that toleration is a temper, not a principle. And I think he says that because his toleration is politically associated with the Liberal Party. And what Dawson wants is a toleration that will extend beyond tribal party politics. So he thought that actually doing proper literary criticism, really responsive stuff, would induct you into a rather different kind of, of politics. Here, here, he said in response. When he was very young, as a young radical, Dawson had spoke in Manchester in 1846 and announced that, that Shakespeare, music, the drama, sculpture and poetry are objective forms in which God exhibits some of his ideas, which sounds sort of mad to us, but in its time, I think, is, is a breakout beyond dogma. And Dawson suggests in his, in the, on, from his pulpit, which is actually a lectern, that there is no infidelity of the intellect, another ringing phrase. So for him, again, close reading, genuine aesthetic responsiveness is itself a form of religion. It is the form of religion beyond dogma in which Dawson is really interested. I want to say a little bit more now to, uh, about a couple of sermons that I found in the library, which he gave in 1864, although I'm looking, I've been going off piece a bit, so I'm going to move around a little bit. Um, and Dawson preaches on Shakespeare and suggests really to his audience that they should see Shakespeare as a way beyond, as a scripture that will supplement and change scripture itself. So he sees the Bible um, as definitively limited, he says, and he draws attention to various things that aren't in it, including erotic love, for instance. He says you don't go there for that. And including the sort of populousness that he sees in Shakespeare and which he sees as a kind of blueprint, an image of what a modern city might be like. And he starts to imagine two worlds, a, a heavenly world. I'm not going to have time to do this. I'm doing it off the, off, off, off the top of my head and I'll get to this, the next bit. Um, and the real world. And he starts to see them giving light and sharing light, a kind of reciprocity between them. And then the real world, which he associates with Shakespeare, becomes more and more glistening because he sees the heavenly world lighting that world and it becomes clear as he's talking that what you're seeing is a kind of modern man in his own pulpit stepping into a secular world which he sees as expressive of some of the desire and possibility of religion it absorbs the heavenly world so he he starts with a kind of equal commitment to both but by the end of the sermon you can tell that it's sort of the that phrase which he didn't invent civic gospel is something used to describe what he did in Birmingham which was basically set up the model of uh, local government, ambitious local government that we inherit. Um, you see it happening because you've got the gospel and it becomes into the civic world. And, and Dawson says at the end, the task for us is to engage with this populous world of men and women which William Shakespeare has given us. Um, so I would have said a lot more about that, but I'm not going to. What I did want to, a sort of new idea that I beginning to entertain about this, which I'd like to try out on you, is that I think what, if looked at anthropologically, one of the things that religion does, I think, is to infuse social life duty um, with a kind of religious, with, with idealism, and to make it potentially an object of desire. And then I think in, you know, this is a madly broad brush, but then in, in many philosophers will tell you, Hegel and others, that with the onset of modernity, private life and satisfaction and so forth becomes much more intensely important. I think correspondingly, 
you need a kind of a new religious myth or something like it that will invest idealism and the possibility of desire in social work and duty with a corresponding intensity. Does that, does that make sense? And I think what Dawson did and is doing with Shakespeare is looking to find that, sees Shakespeare as beyond dogma, um, but as having a kind of aesthetic radiance um, as exemplifying a kind of shining pluralism and co human complexity that might invest um, social life and duty with the kind of magnetism um, that it needs for us to go on living um, responsible and, uh, and socially ambitious lives. Um, how to make personal freedom and fulfilment general? I mean, that seems to me to be one of the, the fundamental and most serious questions of modern liberal culture. And the answers, of course, are very um, varied and there are some very important practical answers to it. What, what, one of them, we don't often talk about these in English literature seminars, is that you need an efficient bureaucracy and you need credible institutions. And George Dawson is committed to those um, via his civic gospel. But I think he also sees that you need to want it, you need to desire it, you need, um, you need a vision. Without the vision, the people will perish. So to wind up and get a better, perhaps more richly specific idea of what this might mean critically, politically, and in religious terms, I want to turn to Dawson's treatment of one character, Ophelia. Dawson at first found Ophelia to be a misogynistic caricature, bearing out a general Anglo-Saxon prejudice, whereby, quote, women are interesting in proportion to their neutrality, whereas in the glorious days of France, wit and intellect were the charm of the grand dame de salon. So he's, 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 he, first he finds Ophelia rather blank and, and empty and thinks she's a symptom of English misogyny, really. Um, and of course, remember, this is before literary criticism. It's before Shakespeare's taught in schools. And he cries out, fancy Ophelia in middle age. I'm sorry for her, but I'm glad that she died. And at that point, <laughs> we're obviously plainly in the days before the establishment of English as a respectable academic uh, discipline, although that questionable directness is perhaps a, a, a bit refreshing. He then starts to sympathise with her and to see her as something more than just erased by patriarchy. When anticipating Freud, he recognises in the lewd rush of talk and song that's released by her madness, a testimony to painful sexual repression. This is him. As long as St George keeps the saddle, the dragon is kept under. But suppose St George out of the saddle, then the dragon may lead up, leap up. So it couldn't be clearer, really. Then turning on his audience, he rushes to defend Ophelia against any lurking disapproval. It is, however, said that it was highly improper that she should know, know such things. But this is talking idly, for we must all know many more wicked things than we do, and a thousand and one reasons might be given why Ophelia should know the songs which she sang in her madness. How did she come to know such songs? Ah, oh, how do people know such things? Would everyone in this assembly like me to know that you know the things you know? <laughs> the poor girl by nature was amorous. I don't find anything unnatural in it. There are many things permissible in secret that only become shameful when uttered. There are indecencies that are only indecencies in the ear. They may be of the earth, earthy, but the earth is a very good thing and not to be despised. So he's, you know, he's, he's interested in Ophelia as increasingly as modelling a real sort of personhood, ambivalent and rich and so forth. But if he spoke up for her repressed sexuality, he also trembled with her grief. In what he called a weekday sermon from Shakespeare, he preached on the theme of Ophelia's flowers in the city, taking as his text, as though it were a verse from scripture, there's a daisy, I would give some violets, but they withered all when my father died. And he does treat Ophelia, as we were all taught not to do, as a, as a real person. He treats Hamlet, perhaps the greatest play in Western literature, as though it were completely analogous to my life or yours, observing that Ophelia's dad, Polonius, wasn't anything exceptionally great, beautiful, wise or good, and yet he insists to this bright and beautiful girl he was part of the world's light and fragrance, and when he died, all the loveliest flowers withered. He trembles with Ophelia's grief, and he calls upon his listeners to do the same. He wants them to feel for her, Shakespeare's heroine because he believes it could wake them up morally. 
opening up a channel of sympathy to the many real women in 19th century Birmingham who were vulnerable to being suddenly devastated by grief and thrown into a life of financial insecurity and hardship in a context where men, women were literally the property of their husbands and fathers. Dawson's insists to his listeners that there were Ophelias all over contemporary Birmingham. And he explains, all our Ophelias do not go insane when their fathers die, but nonetheless do their violets wither. And truly they stand greatly in need of charity's tenderest sympathy, who having been cared for all their lives by a good father who planned and strove that they might want for nothing but live in the sunshine and be beautiful and happy, suddenly find that life means toil and strife and forethought and the hope deferred and makes the heart sick, who have to pay the world's price for daily bread, which is so difficult always for girls to win. Some are friends who had known them when the world was a garland of roses and every day a holiday won't know them any longer. Their eyes are red with work and weeping. The sweet fragrance of youth is going. The gay colours are gone. Alas, alas, there are thousands of beautiful young Ophelias, not insane, saying today, here's ruin plenty and just one poor daisy left. I'd give you violets as I used to, but they withered when my father died. This is not a fate to be lightly spoken of. It's natural to wish to be bright and winning and free from care. It's hard to forego the sunshine that we may earn wages and see the face lose its beauty that the hands may win its bread. It's pleasant to be sought and loved and admired. It's hard to mix only with masters, bargain makers and self-seekers. It's pleasant to have your hands filled with violets. It's hard to put down those flowers and take up work. Farewell, old home, old pleasures, old friends. There aren't any violets now. They withered when my father died. So Dawson sees Ophelia's everywhere. He sees Ophelia's flowers as a suitable theme for a sermon because he recognizes that Shakespeare's play actively addresses contemporary life. He imagines Shakespeare's sad words in the mouths of real working women. He urges his hearers to respond sympathetically to the crushing bereavement suffered by Shakespeare's heroine and then to open their hearts to thousands, his word of real, once privileged women whose lives might be suddenly devastated by death and the threat of po poverty. And he does this, I think, and this is the last point I want to make rather briefly, but in, in the name of solidarity as well as in the name of diversity. And I feel that this 19th century story as a way of recognising as something we need in contemporary theory. Solidarity is the context in which diversity flourishes. It is what diversity enriches. Um, and I think there's perhaps a need in, in, in some current debates to bring those two things back into a new conjunction. This story, anyway, of what George Dawson was doing in the 19th century might cast some lights on that. As I said, I haven't spoken to you at all really about the project, but about the man in the hinterland who um, inspired it and did so much for Birmingham and indeed has been forgotten for, for Shakespeare. Thank you.